All right, welcome to WSQ number eight, uh, looking inside cells. And what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look and start to look at uh, what we see in the inside of cells. And so a couple objectives today, we want to find out what the role of the cell wall and cell membrane, uh, what role they play in the cell. We're going to learn what the role of the nucleus is in the cell. And then we're going to talk about some of the organelles, the cytoplasmic organelles that are found um, inside the cell's cytoplasm and what their functions are, at least a general function. We'll definitely expand on those in class. And how do cells differ? So what makes cells different one from another? So those are the objectives today. Um, try to get this one going so we can get it done. So um, first thing we gotta do is we gotta uh, imagine ourselves on this journey into the cell. We have to start by getting into the cell. And every cell has a structure that provides support and um, security so that organisms can't just come in. Some cells have what's called a cell wall, and how a cell wall works is a cell wall is a rigid, non-living material that protects and supports the cell. We'll see this in plant uh, cells, where plant cells have these rigid cell walls that are not living, but that allow the cell, it gives not only structure to the plant overall in general, um, but it also is used to protect and support the cell. This is one of the reasons why you'll see a lot of times uh, you, with plants, uh, if you eat rooty vegetables, things like that, they have a crunch to them. That's partially for, because of turgor pressure or water pressure that's applied inside the plant. But also, secondly, there's the rigid layers. You're actually um, eating through cellulose or these protective uh, structures made by the cell wall. Um, the other thing that they can have is they can have what's called a cell membrane. And this is the case of, let's say, animal cells. Um, what happens in a cell membrane is this is a, a structure in this can happen in both types. This is a structure that controls what substances come in and out of the cell. A lot of times you'll hear the cell membrane, cell membrane referred to as, they, as a um, selectively permeable membrane. And what that actually means, that big word just means that it's able to determine uh, which substances are allowed in and which substances are not allowed in, which of course would be similar to, think of like a, a gate keeper, you know, a security guard that's at, at the gate of a, a main entrance to a building that uh, is able to decide. And you can see even here in this example, let me grab you, right here we can see that there's even different types of items. They have these transport proteins we'll talk about, which actually allow certain things in and out. Okay, um, and they also notice that it's basically, you'll find out real quickly that cell membranes are made up of a lipid layer. This is lipid, another term for lipid is fat. So a fat layer, and then it's made up of a host of proteins and carbohydrate chains. So we're gonna talk about why it's important, our diet and nutrition as we progress, uh, what we eat and what we intake, why that's important. So every Anything that wants to get into a cell, food or oxygen, nutrition, the different nutrition, um, has to go through either the cell wall or the cell membrane. There is a really cool uh, plant and animal cells activity online at phschool.com. I would encourage you guys to put in this web code, CEP3012, right here. Um, go there, go to this web address, phschool.com. Put this in, really cool little opportunity to kind of help you through the plant and animal cells. And it'll help you understand better uh, the difference between plant and animal cells. Now, what we're going to do for the rest of this time, the balance of this time pretty much, is to talk about um, the difference between animal cells and plant cells. You'll have plenty of activities in class uh, over the next week or so where we'll be talking about these different organelles. And how they function. But I want you to just notice right now as we look up on the screen, we can already see that there's some distinct differences. The shape, we can see the, the cell wall on the outside, which is very rigid in a plant, and the membrane, which is not so rigid in an animal cell. Um, we can also see that plant cells, if you look closely, have some things that animal cells don't. These massive vacuoles in plant cells, you have vacuoles over here, but different function than in plants. Okay. You'll notice plants also have these things called chloroplasts that you won't find over here in the animal cell. So there's going to be some variety of things, some, some different characteristics and qualities that you're going to see. Excuse me. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by going through and talking about the different, okay, each of these examples, endoplasmic reticulum, our cell wall, ribosomes, nuclei, okay, nucleus. Okay, cytoplasm, all these things we're talking about are related to 
the cytoplasmic or cell organelles. Okay, so think of it as organelles as little tiny organs, and each of these have specific functions. So let's start with probably the most important one. Okay, if we look in the center of our cell right here, we have what's known as the nucleus. The nucleus is the cell's control center. This is the part of the cell that actually directs all of the cell's activities. Inside of the nucleus, we find the chromatin, okay, and on those chromatin, okay, ultimately we're gonna find DNA. And that DNA, okay, deoxyribonucleic acid, is the cell's genes, okay? Think of the DNA as the blueprints, right? So if I build a house, I have to have some blueprints, and the DNA are those blueprints. Those blueprints allow us to know what cell parts, what structures, what functions have to be created. Within the nucleus, you also have some things. You have the nuclear envelope, which is kind of like this encasing that protects the nucleus, and you have the nucleolus, which is, uh, nucleolus is a central portion of the nucleus. Uh, a lot of times people get the nucleolus uh, confused. Um, this is the place where ribosomes are made, and we're going to talk about ribosomes in a, in, a, in a minute. So they're really, really important. Um, so within the middle of this nucleus, you have the genetic information, you have the ribosome factory, uh, really important aspect to this per se, uh, particular portion. Now the nuclear envelope, as we talked about, is the protection of the nucleus. It determines what's let in and out of the nucleus. Okay, So it's very similar to the cell membrane. Uh, yet it just works with a more specific. Um, the chromatin, as I said, contain the genetic material that is actually the instructions for cell function. So all of our DNA that tells us what structures to be made and what they're useful for. The nucleolus, as we said, where ribosomes are made. So that would be this portion right here. So those are the different parts of the nucleus. Let's talk about another one. Another organelle in the cytoplasm is known as the mitochondrion. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. Okay? The reason why we call them the powerhouse of the cell is because this is where energy is converted from food molecules. So what happens, the mitochondria is that factory that takes the food molecules, breaks them down, and converts them into energy that the cells can use to carry out their functions. Similar to if you put gasoline in your car, okay, the engine actually burns up the gasoline and that gasoline, that fuel source, becomes a energy source. Right? It's turned into energy that moves pistons, that moves your axle and causes your car to drive. <laughs> Same thing, without the mitochondria, you would have no powerhouse, you'd have no cell plant. Right? Think of a power plant that, that runs the cell. Then we have something called the endoplasmic reticulum. You can also call this, a lot of times I'll just call this the ER not emergency room. <laughs> the endoplasmic reticulum is similar to the system of hallways in a building. So you imagine it um, literally like as up here in our, our own uh, school, we have this long hallway. Imagine multiple hallways that are working as delivery systems. So what the endoplasmic reticulum does is allows proteins and other materials to move throughout the cell by using this freeway, basically, this, this hallway system for uh, by way of the endoplasmic reticulum. And so it makes uh, travel very, very convenient and very effective inside of the cell. So that's how the endoplasmic, so think of it like our road system. Then you have the ribosomes, and you'll find the ribosomes found free in the cell and on the endoplasmic reticulum. So all these little dots here are ribosomes, okay? Ribosomes are vitally important because they produce proteins. Now, a lot of people don't realize that Proteins, without proteins, we would be in some serious trouble because proteins actually make up everything that we are. So ribosomes are those little factories that produce those proteins. And remember, ribosomes are produced where? They're produced in the nucleolus, inside of the nucleus. So uh, there's this connection where ribosomes produce those proteins which make up all of the different structures of our body of each organism. Then we have what's called the Golgi body, also known as the Golgi apparatus, or Golgi, okay? Um, the Golgi body um, is very similar. These are, this is where proteins are received and other materials, they come from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the Golgi bodies actually package them. So these kind of act like 
Uh, if you imagine, you know, you're making a product on an assembly line and I build this product and then it goes to somebody who packages it and puts it, you know, correctly. This is what the Gol Golgi bodies do. They receive that information and then they reform it. They package it and then distribute it to the other parts of the cell. So these are kind of like, you know, very vital um, structure that gets those proteins shaped and, and packaged as they should be. Now, then we run into chloroplast. Now we said before, chloroplasts are example of a structure that's found in plants, but not in animals. Chloroplasts are actually the structure that, that allows plants to capture energy from the sunlight and use it to produce food through photosynthesis. So inside the chloroplast, you can actually see right here in this image, if I could zoom in, I wish I could, um, here inside you'd find little disks that are stacked like this and those little discs that are stacked those are chlorophyll if you've heard of chlorophyll when you studied uh, when you studied the uh, process of photosynthesis chlorophyll are the actual f structures that absorb the sun's ultraviolet light its energy and use it to make food through that process of photosynthesis so chloroplast really important and only found in plants okay so we won't find these uh, typically in animals there's also a storage area of the cells where you can store food or water or waste, and this can be found in both plants and animals that are called vacuoles. Okay, um, most plants have large vacuoles, which basically stores mostly water, but it can also store food and waste materials. In the case of animals, the vacuoles um, are also used. They don't typically have a central vacuole. The animals have multiple little smaller vacuoles. I don't know if I have an image. I don't little smaller vacuoles where they would actually store um, structures and items. Next that brings us to lysosomes. Um, lysosomes are also found in animal cells and lysosomes, we can see them right down here, are small round structures that contain chemicals that break down certain materials in the cell. They can break down old uh, cell parts, they can break down um, certain materials or large food particles things like that so they're more manageable so their jobs kind of are kind of like the cleanup crew that breaks things down into smaller pieces more manageable pieces that can go into other parts of the cell and be, be used and functional so um, those are basically the major cytoplasmic organelles so if I went over them with you you'd, you'd remember we started with the nucleus which is found in both plants and animals the endoplasmic reticulum the Golgi bodies the ribosomes the mitochondria, the vacuoles, the lysosomes, and then in plant cells we would include things like the um, the central vacuole, the chloroplast, okay, um, the cell wall, the cell membrane. All of those things go together to make up this variety of cell structures. Now, the variety of cell structures um, or the structure in cells reflects that different cells have different functions. Not every cell has the exact same function, just like in the body of Christ, not every single one of us are called to be teachers or preachers or you know, called to be evangelists. Uh, we're called for different functions. We may have a general call to proclaim the gospel and tell people about Jesus, but we have specific functions. We have specific um, uh, attributes and traits which God has given us. We have things that we're better at than others. So the shape, the size, the types of the organelles, all those things influence the function of each cell and the diversity of the organism. So even within the human body, not all cells are alike. If we went into, for example, the muscle cells, you have three major muscle cells, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, and smooth muscle. They're all muscle, but those three types of muscle have a variety of different uses. Cardiac muscles in your heart, and it has to beat long periods of time because it beats billions of times in your life. You've got skeletal muscles, your biceps, your triceps, your pectoralis major, gluteus maximus, all these muscles, they're long and sinuous and their design is to be able to, to contract strongly, but they're not involuntary. They're voluntary. We can cause them to contract. And then you have smooth muscles that you're in your intestines and line your, your um, blood vessels. They have a totally different function. They're designed to be involuntary and to work without you thinking about them. So cells have a variety and diversity of how they're used. Now, here's just a quick image, and this one does it, it's a little bit blurry, but I want to show you this. Notice that just inside, let's say, the human arm, we have a variety of cells. We have epithelial tissue, which is uh, talking about skin, okay, the surface of the body. We have um, cells that have 
in connective tissue. Connective tissue would be like your tendons and your uh, cartilage. We have tissue like the bone, okay, which is a totally different connective tissue that's made up, that's really hard. You have things like blood. Blood is a form of connective tissue that's made up of cells that are in a liquid matrix. They're actually in what's called plasma. And so you get these variety of tissues. You have nervous tissue that's found throughout your arm that consists of cells that actually transmit electrical signals. You have little like wiring conduits. You have muscle tissue, which is made up of fibers that can contract and, and cause you to lift or, or move something. So each of these cells have different functions and they have different design or structure because of that. Uh, you wouldn't want a muscle cell to be shaped like a bone. Okay, you wouldn't you want it to be hard like a bone, it wouldn't work. Uh, you wouldn't want it to calcify. You wouldn't want a nervous tissue to be really massed and tight. They, they're spread out and they're able to send signals clearly. So there's all of these different cells and the diversity of these cells work together to make our bodies uh, function, to make our bodies act in a way that, that makes us um, able to move, able to live, able to function as God designs us. So, all right. So that's WSQ number eight. Uh, you've watched it. Hopefully you've taken good notes and uh, summarize in, on haiku and answer those questions. There were two of them in this one. And I will see you guys in class. Bye.